I'm here with Bill Britt. Uh, Bill Britt is a local hero. He's one of a uh, longtime activist and advocate for patients' rights. His work goes well beyond the medical marijuana community, um, and it goes all the way from the medical marijuana community into the courts. And Bill's personally responsible for some of the success I've had in the legal system, what success I've had, he's been partly responsible for. So uh, when we began the human solution, shoot, almost four years ago, um, a bunch of groups and, and leaders of different groups sat together at a table at a friend, a mutual friend Charles Monson's house. And we all said, well, you know, we're sort of a, a little bit of a gap in the community and we need to, maybe if we came together, we could fill some of that gap in some way. And we all decided to work together. We didn't really put it together as how it was going to be, but we decided we were going to start working together. And, and, and Bill was here. And I can remember one time when we did our very first Freedom Fighters fundraiser. Uh, almost four years ago, we were raising money for it's been four years. Almost four years. Uh, Ronnie Knowles and myself. And uh, I remember Bill coming to our our event, and I said, "So, what do you think, Bill? How are we doing?" He says, "You guys are doing good. We'll see where you're at in a year." And I can remember thinking that. I took that to heart. And I says, "You're right. You're very right. Where will we be in a year?" A year later, we did the next Freedom Fighters. And I says, "How about now?" He says, "You guys are doing a lot better." Here we are another two years later, and we're fighting just as strong as ever. So I'd like to introduce Bill Brand. Tell us about yourself. Well, on that note, I'd just like to say, you know, I've been in this movement for 15 years, and I've seen a lot of people come and go, and you see people who are, have motivation, you know, either it's monetary or it's ego, or, you know, and these people usually are weeded out within a year or so. They see if you're just in it for the money, if you're just in it for the ego, you know, most times it's not going to play out. You know, <laughs> you have to be dedicated. You know, it takes a long time. And and but what I've seen is that the, the dedicated people shine out. They last. They last. You know, and I've been there for more than a year. You know, and I've seen you. Know, and other times I see people who get arrested and have to. You know, their lives are torn apart, and they're financially and their families are. You know, but and what usually happens after they go through that, then and you never see them again. So. Uh, but there's a small group that says, what happened to me that was so wrong, I just can't see this happen to anybody else. I can't, I can't stand it. I understand the pain that I went through. And to see, to know that any other person is going to have to go through this, for a healthy person to go through this court, to be dragged through the courts, uh, it, it's, you know, it's financially devastating. But you know, for a person with a mental or physical disability, now you add on that, you know, I've seen lives destroyed, I've seen people thrown in jail, I've seen people with mental disorders tased, I've heard of people being tasered in jail because they didn't respond because of their disabilities. You know, I have many horror stories that I could say, and, and for the longest time I would just, uh, you know, patients would call me as a patient advocate, I'm the director of the Association of Patient Advocates, so by heart, I, I'm a patient advocate, and when patients at first, they would call me and say, you know, I got arrested, or the, the cops told me, we don't follow that law here, we don't follow that law here. You know, and at first it was so prevalent, you know, and they were taking it away. They took my medicine away, and I was thinking, how can we stop them from doing this? Well, you know what? Cops hate giving cannabis back. So I said, well, let's fight this. And I don't care if it was a half a gram, if anybody, somebody would call me, we just they get caught with a gram, I don't care. I went to court with them. If they had a public defender, I would educate their public defender. And, you know, for the longest time, for 10 years, I'm just sitting in the court and I'm listening to the cops lie, and I'm listening to all the, I'm tearing my hair, the little hair I had left. I say, no, that's not true. That's a lie. That's not true. That's not true. And all you're hearing, this guy's got 100 pounds. He's got 100 pounds. Well, you know, finally the lawyers started listening to me, and I educated myself about the law, and I knew more than the lawyers. And, I, and, and the people, what I would do is, is you're scared, they're alone, the lawyers don't tell you anything, and you're, you know, you, you know, and if you're mentally disabled or physically disabled, it's even worse. And so what I found a lot of times, I was just there as a handle. And as somebody with experience, I got through this, there's so many cases, I could explain, no, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen when the lawyer said something. I could explain in layman's terms what they actually meant. And just by having somebody there, the people, you know, I was able to ease suffering. And it was, you know, to be able to ease suffering without, you know, first goal in life, you know, and, and what happened was I started going, uh, educating the lawyers, and a lawyer actually got me on the stand. Where's Mark Holland got me on the stand? 
And so I was able to, when the cop said, this guy's got 100 pounds, he said, hey, dope dealer, he's got a scale, and he's got this, and you know. Well, no, I went down to the police department and I weighed it, and guess what? When I weighed it, it only weighed 30 pounds because the plants dried out. And guess what? It only weighed 15 pounds because the box is in packaging. And guess what? What was there, the 15 pounds was roots and dirt and stalks and stems, and really only 10% of that, or 1.5 pounds, which would last a typical patient. Well, even that 1.5 pounds, the cops say, this guy, was, that's way more. You use a quarter gram per day, and this is enough. This is 2,700 doses, and this will last 37 years. I said, no. Oh, it's the trafficking. No, the federal government gives up to six pounds, you know, and this pound and a half would last a typical patient about three or four months. Well, guess what? It takes about, if you're growing indoors, you need to have a three or four month supply until the next crop comes in. If you're growing outdoors, you have to have a whole year supply. My letter allows me six pounds, and you know, so I started going. So I actually got on the stand, and I started. And the, the judges are listening to me, you know. And you know, I have a high school degree. I don't have any, you know, I don't have any college degrees. I don't have any horticulture degrees. But you can't get a degree in marijuanaology. I'm sorry, there's no place except Amsterdam University. And and for a time, I actually taught. I'm a professor at Amsterdam University when they were teaching down here. I taught classes, you know, so, and I taught doctors, and, but and then you learn, you know, I'm really a patient advocate, but unfortunately I spent the last, you know, 15 years operating after the bombs fall, going to court and helping people who are, when I really, what I really want to do is do prevention and early intervention, you get people with cancer, people who are suffering, you know, I'm a testimony, you know, my, if I wasn't using cannabis, I'd be using painkillers, muscle relaxers, antidepressants, anti-nausea medications, I mean, anti-seizure medications. I, I've been able to kick, quit all the drugs, all pharmaceutical drugs whatsoever. My, my grandma's seizures were under control. My nausea, my, my anxiety, my, my insomnia is all covered by one medicine. And you know what's amazing about that? Is it's not even unusual anymore. Your, that story you just told, I've heard that same story by dozens and dozens of people that have gone through issues where they had hundreds, or not hundreds, dozens of different medications that this one plan has kept them from having to take them and their quality of life has gotten better. So, and uh, shortly after the law passed, I went to my county clinic doctor and asked, will you write this recommendation? He said, no, it's against policy. Well, who makes policy? This is one of the reasons why I formed the Association of Patient Advocates, but because I believe that patients should be involved in this policy-making process, especially when it really affects me. And so I started going up the ladder. I said, well, who makes policy, and how do I get into this policy-making process? And I went to the clinic director, and she said, oh, I don't think you can qualify. No, it's against policy. And I went to the county, I wrote letters to the county health department. I said, it's against policy. We can't authorize it. And I went to the state health department. It's against policy. We, we, we can't. I even went to Washington, D.C. with Americans for Safe Access in 2002 to question the fact that marijuana has no business being a Schedule One drug. And I was arrested, and uh, we got the interest. There's 15 of us, 14 of us from 10 different states. My arrest buddy from Texas, you know, his only hope was rescheduled. So, I you know, it was my first trip to the Washington, D.C. Right. I did a tour of the Lincoln Memorial or the, uh, the uh, Washington Monument, but I did tour the you know, tour the downtown jail facility, and we were sending notice, you know, this is in 2002, that this is, you know, this needs to be rescheduled. And, and our petition was ignored for nine years, and then they finally, uh, then they heard it, and then they denied it which gave us the opportunity to question. So for the first time in 20 years, we get to bring evidence forward that says, cannabis does have medical value, and it should be rescheduled. And, and was you taking a stand then, that's now brought it to the place where you're making a change. Patients, I call it the patient Ad Association of Patient Advocates for three reasons. Because we are patients who are advocates, and nobody knows a condition like somebody who's lived with it, not even a doctor. Uh, working with uh, people with disabilities and, and going for long-term goals takes, takes a great deal of patience. Yes, it does. And 10 years, I got a great deal of patience yes, you know, in 10 years, but for, most and foremost, we advocate for patient rights. We are patient advocates, and it's wrong. The fact that cannabis is not accessible to people who are suffering is so wrong. 
is so wrong. And, I, and when I was in jail in, in Washington, D.C., I felt proud because I knew that same jail cell, there were people from the, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, from the Vietnam War protests, and I felt proud. And I knew that I was a part of a social movement, a social change, that, that somebody has to do it. Somebody has to get out there. And if everybody who believed that cannabis should be accessible spoke up, the role would be deafening. Yeah. And it's time to come out of the closet. It's time to speak up for our rights. It's time to put pressure on our politicians because they're not going to do it. The president isn't going to do it. And I don't expect him to on his own. There has to be a roar. We have to go out there and roar. So it's on us. Not only do I, have I learned that one person can make a difference, and I personally made a, a difference in many people's lives, but I know that you can make a difference. And so I challenge you and I call on you to make a difference, and I know you can, so go out there and make a difference. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bill. You are a hero. Thank you for what you, you do. You are part of the human solution. Always. Thank you.